July the 27th, is that near enough? 1973. Hmm. Oh, well, if you say so. And what made you start doing it organically, Jeff? Walking by a stall on an agricultural showground and it was organised by the Soil Association. This was which is the which is the uh, certification body in England and it's probably one of the original ones. And they had leaflets there and a compost heap and various other things and I thought oh, I'll come home. <laughs> There's more than one definition for organic. One is it's a legal term and you're only allowed to use that, le that term if you are registered to use it and inspected regularly to prove that you are doing it according to organic standards. But organic also um, would mean doing, so growing, what would you say, in a sustainable way? No, it has to be more than that. Pardon? It has to be more than that. More than sustainable. Yeah, because you could possibly be sustainable and still use chemicals. All right. Yeah. So you would, it would be without the use of chemicals in agriculture in any way, without the use of pesticides, insecticides, uh, artificial fertilizers. Um, but it would also have to be sustainable so that you could keep that, it, basically so you could, it could go on forever. If you support organic agriculture, you're supporting your environment, you're supporting the ecology, um, and you're supporting also the, the grower's rights. Because um, usually it means that if you want to be registered as an organic grower, you have to pay fair wages, you have to do everything in a fair way, as well as doing it right for the environment and for the health of the soil. Would you agree with that, Mr Fowler? We grow the kind of vegetables that thrive in this environment. We don't try growing the kind of Mediterranean crops that you might be able to grow elsewhere, because the climate doesn't allow it. We grow a kind of carrot, for instance, that can grow right through the winter. All the vegetables we grow are the kind that people, most people eat in their daily diet here and it's a good variety um, and it gives us a good rotation every four years for the different varieties. Um, the animals we have, we have pigs um, because they're good for the ground. We have the kind of cattle we have a short horn because their feet are suited to the kind of terrain that there is here. Um, we have a lot of wild life, birds, flowers, animals, and really that's because of the chemicals used up here. So one of the things we feel that is when an animal is, a, is raised with access to outdoors or completely living outdoors, it's, um, it's a, being allowed to behave naturally. And that's part of the legislation for it being organic. But the meat from them is stress-free. Uh, any animal that's reared uh, intensively is in a stressful situation. It's not allowed to behave according to its nature and it's stressful for it. So the meat isn't as good. Um, and actually, even if... The truth is, I think, even if the meat weren't that different, you'd still do it that way because you think it's not fair to take an intelligent animal and cage it. You wouldn't use any growth hormones or antibiotics as a growth pr promoter. You only use them when the animal's sick and just for the minimum amount of time. And apart from that, they eat what's natural. They, ha they actually have to eat organic feed, either organic feed that we produce or that we buy in. They're not allowed anything genetically modified you Americans. <laughs> In fact, if you have GM feed on the holding, you can lose your certification. It's that serious. Um, 
for the animals. It's just it's great to see them having a happy, natural life. We take them to be slaughtered in the same county where we live and actually we don't send them off. We take them, we lead them in and we know that when they get there they have no idea what's coming and they're calm and happy. Quite often they're quite curious about what's happening next and then we leg it fast. <laughs> the problem is that if you use pesticides um, or herbicides it's detrimental to the wild animal or bird population because if, for instance if you use a pesticide in the greenhouse and kill off all the green fly then when the ladybirds hatch out to eat all the green fly there's nothing for them to eat so they die off and they don't reproduce and the common practice here is to spray the, for blight on the potatoes which is a kind of fungus they at this time of year, they, every other day sometimes, isn't it? Maybe not quite that often, but certainly every four or five days. Because if it every, rains, yeah. it washes it off. So. so they spray with chemicals every four or five days to keep the potatoes alive. What we would do, instead of spraying, we would plant a potato that's resistant to the blight so that it doesn't need spraying. Um, it's the same with like carrot fly and the carrots. We sow the carrots at a time that's between the carrot fly hatchings so that they're less likely to be attacked by carrot fly. It's actually working with nature, not against it. And I think that's the biggest difference between conventional agriculture and organic agriculture. It's not easy to market produce because always the big boys are trying to push the prices down. The wholesalers are trying to get it for as little as possible. They're trying to sell it to the public for as little as possible, which I understand, but it means quite often that the farmer gets squeezed out. So what we decided to do was actually, we looked at having a market stall, which we have done before, and we thought probably in this climate, the best thing to do is actually have a shop where it started out, we could sell our produce and other people could and still do sell their produce. Um, so it's an outlet for organic and natural growers in the area. Um, and a woman came in the shop one day and she said, do you know, it's really nice to think that you've got something like this in your own town. People know 